Hello and uh, welcome everyone again to another rendition of Global Immunotalk. Uh, my name is Burkhard Becher and I'm at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. And it's my great pleasure to host today's Global Immunotalk speaker, and that is uh, uh, Martin Prilic. Martin Prilic is a professor at uh, the Fred Hutch Cancer Center in Seattle. Um, in, again, it's it's an incredible pl uh, pleasure to finally have a chance to uh, to host you, uh, uh, Martin. And uh, Martin did this. Um, Martin is 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 born in Linz in Austria. And uh, for those of you who are geographically challenged, this is not down under, so it's not Australia, but Austria is right next to Switzerland in Europe, uh, where Martin also did his uh, his his masters. He studied in Salzburg. Uh, then went for uh, a PhD with Steve Jameson uh, in uh, at the University of Minnesota, and uh, in 2004 he went for a postdoctoral fellowship with uh, Mike Bevan at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, in 2011, uh, Martin became an assistant member at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, also in Seattle. And then he climbed the career ladder and uh, became, uh, uh, in 2017, an associate professor. And uh, uh, congratulations once again. This year, uh, he uh, became one of the elderly uh, uh, and frail uh, uh, people like uh, many of us. He is now full professor at, uh, at Fred Hutch. And uh, Martin's research is is pretty diverse, uh, and and he has done he's done incredibly well for himself. He's uh, published a, a couple of incredibly powerful papers lately, and uh, you know one of the biggest he won many many prizes, many awards. One of them worth mentioning here right now, maybe the NIH Director's New Innovator Award that he got. So Martin has been working on defining and manipulating the signals that control uh, lymphocytes, specifically T cells and NK cells, but also made cells and the cell fate decisions that they're making, uh, studied the T cell functional changes across uh, the healthy steady state tissues, but also in, in inflamed tissues and in cancer. And I, what I think what Martin is perhaps most known for is for developing really, really innovative tools for the single cell analysis of immune cells and maybe with a specific, specific focus on, on uh, tissue resident immune responses or tissue based immune responses, if you wish. And um, before I go on and on and on uh, hyping everyone here, I'm sure this is going to be an amazing seminar. But uh, as you all know, at Global Immuno Talks, what we do, we always ask a general question to the speaker. And the question for you, Martin, um, um, before I, I give you uh, the screen and everything. So who has been uh, or is a scientific role model for you? And, and why would that be? Hmm. So I think, you know, the the, I mean, typically when we think of role models, it's it's sort of associated with a person, and I've, I've definitely definitely been very fortunate in, in the mentors that um, that I had from my PhD and postdoc. Um, I think the in sort of a bit of a larger context, um, I do remember when I first came to Minnesota and just the uh, the way that at the Center for Immunology, the way that science was approached there, it was just. Um, incredibly supportive and challenging at the same time, which I think is, is something that's really important to set up, but I think at the same time, also very difficult. And um, uh, I mean, the same people that the core group of people that was around, um, like back then when I first came to Minnesota, they're, they're all still there. You mentioned Steve, right? Steve Jameson, Chris Hoquist, Mark Jenkins, Dan Miller, just to name a few. Um, uh, and I think they really managed to set up like this, this incredible environment to um, to do excellent science. And I think that's always something that's been um, in the back of my mind to try and, and achieve something similar, at least aim, try and aim for that. Um, so I think I think in some ways that that's really been like the first and like most profound impact in terms of um, sort of an ideal of, of how something should be. You know what? The funny thing is, Martin, I, I remember very well when I was giving Global Immune Talk, I was asked the very same question. I answered pretty much the same way. I was thinking about like who inspired me the most is like a book of Max Planck or something like this. But no, it was in fact my my supervisors for PhD and postdoc and the environment I was growing up there that really inspired me the most. And I, I appreciate the answer. It's funny that we have quite a bit in common already. So um, 
without further ado, Martin, uh, share your screen. The floor is yours. Good. All right. Excellent. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Burkhard, for the very, very kind introduction. And um, uh, thank you um, for the organizers um, for uh, for inviting me and, and giving me the opportunity to talk here. Um, so um, I, I will talk a little bit actually more about the inflamed and, and tumor uh, tissue aspect. I decided to take out some of the, the healthy aspect just for the sake of time. Um, and as, as Book had mentioned in his introduction, um, one thing that my lab is really interested in is, is sort of trying to understand what the signals are that guide lymphocyte activation, differentiation, um, and maintenance in, in specifically in tissues and human tissues. Uh, and ideally, if, if things work well, then we would like to manipulate those cues, those signals to control lymphocyte responses for therapeutic purposes. So what I thought um, I can do for this talk today is rather than walking you through um, maybe some published and unpublished figures is to provide a little bit of context on, on how we in general try to address these questions and, and how we try and address um, and approach sort of those bigger science, hopefully bigger science uh, um, questions that, that we have. Um, so let, me, let me just move this here. Martin, you accidentally muted yourself. Can you unmute yourself again? Sorry. Oh, thank you. Sorry. I was trying to move things around because there are all these things. Don't, up. don't. <laughs> all good then. Um, so so the big the big question um that we had at the at the beginning, you know, in terms of figuring out well, what is what can we actually realistically um ask and then also um address successfully, hopefully. Um, we tried to figure out what are what are the and think a bit about what are the components that we need to accomplish this. And if you want to study human tissues, um, obviously a big part are your clinical collaborators and, and the cohorts that you work with. And um, my two key collaborators, um, particularly from what I'm talking about today, um, are, are Doug Dixon, who used to be here at the University of Washington, now a little while ago moved to the University of Tennessee. Uh, and Doug has been sort of my, my longest collaboration. Uh, so he's a periodontist um, and been initially reached out to him at this point a few years ago, uh, the, the way we, we went about trying to figure out if we had some, some common ground and some common interest in, in questions was by really having weekly meetings. Um, and I would tell him about demonology and, and Doug would very patiently answer all of my very naive questions that, that were clinically related. And I really learned a, um, an incredible amount that I think helped us figure out what we can and cannot um, address. Um, in terms of tissues that we're getting, what what do we know and need to know about the the patients, uh, potential confounding factors, um, and then a few years later, I started collaborating with um, Brittany Barber, who's at the University of, of Washington here. So for us, um, the the clinical collaborators are not just someone who just kind of hands us over a tissue, but it was um, learning from them was a a key step uh, and a really critical component for um, for our science. Um, <clears throat> the other part is is the technology aspect, and um, it's the, the very exciting part about technology, I think, particularly in the last few years, is how rapidly things have been um, evolving. And, and uh, I mean, we can do things now that could only dream of 10, 10 years ago. So to, to see that the progress has just been very exciting at the same time staying on top of that and, and not sort of getting left behind is incredibly challenging. And the way that we've been trying to um, make sure that we stay on top, top and, and, um, uh, and move things forward is uh, with industry collaborations. And uh, my key collaborator um, is in that context has been Aaron Tishnik at uh, BD Biosciences, um, who's been with, and so Aaron has been with BD, uh, I think for, it must be close to 10 years at this point. And we've been collaborating for quite a few years and all of this started out um, with um, um, incredibly talented postdoc that I had in my lab, Florian Maya, who 
it's just a flow cytometry wizard. And when he joined the lab, he essentially developed uh, a 28 color, what we call 30 parameter, because it's 20 colors and then forward side scatter panel um, to do Im deep immunophenotyping for, for the human immune cell compartments. We did it for neuritic cells and T cells. And we essentially we leveraged this then into doing multi-omics um, approaches and get a sense of how well sequencing-based approaches compare sort of to these classic flow cytometry approaches. And from there on, it's just kind of been moving moving forward <clears throat> and, and doing this together uh, with, with the industry collaborator has just been immensely um, beneficial for us. So and just to make sure as that, that uh, we're all on the same page here, just want to give a very, very quick overview. So for high parameter flow cytometry, uh, we like to use that because it can essentially interrogate millions of, of cells. And there's really fairly minimal cell loss during uh, processing and um, analysis. So um, this, this is a, a great way to get a good sense of what the immune infiltrate is in a tissue, particularly if the tissue piece that you um, um, want to interrogate is fairly small, uh, for example, a biopsy rather than a resected, surgically resected tissue. Um, so for single cell RNA-seq, the, the number of cells that you can actually look at is, is much smaller, but it's, it's <clears throat> um, it used to be in the, actually a few years ago, people were happy with dozens of, of single cells, and then it sort of progressed more and more uh, with different platforms. And I think at this point, sort of as a, a rough ballpark number, you can do about 100,000 cells sort of in, a, in an experiment, um, depending on which platform you use. And you get about 2,000 genes per single cell, and you can also get um, protein expression along with that, um, and then BDJ expression. So it's a really, um, uh, just a really rich data set uh, than you end up with. Um, but the one thing that I want to point out too in, in that context, I think, um, sort of just having these phenotypic data is, is also somewhat limiting. So we always do try and, and um, have follow-up assays, ex vivo assays, or use the mouse model to try and get more towards um, mechanism as much as that is really possible uh, in you know context of working with human tissues and human samples. Um, so in addition to the, the cohort and the technology aspect, um, since, since I just brought up um, sort of those really big big data sets, um, it's, it's the data analysis part. And I think for us, it was really important to make sure that we don't just end up with a sort of a signature set of genes at the very end. And we wanted to make sure that if you put in all this effort to get the single cell data, that we try and really get the most out of the, the data set um, afterwards. And um, Rafael Guitardo, who actually um, used to be here at the at Fred Hutch, was a, a key collaborator, um, and you'll hear more during my talk of um, what he and his group accomplished, and Rafael moved um, a little while ago now, uh, actually, to, to Switzerland, where, where Bukhreta is. He's, he's in um, Lausanne, not in, not in Zurich, but, um, uh, and then Peter, Peter Lindsley, has, um, who's um, at the Benaroya Research Institute here in Seattle, has also been a, a key collaborator for us. Um, and then once once we get um, you know sort of data back from from these big experiments, um, there are follow up questions. And I guess in my very <laughs> biased view as a immunologist, I think hopefully that's where we come in, right? And and all the papers that that we read along the way will help us figure out what actually are the the right questions to ask in that context. What are the best um, follow up questions? <clears throat> so what I thought I'll talk a bit about um, today is is um, a project that I think started with a very uh, really with a very simple question, and we just wanted to know what are the differences between inflamed human tissues and and human tumor tissues, and the reason why we asked that question was because if you read reviews about the tumor microenvironment about the immune infiltrate in the tumor microenvironment. Um, a lot of the phenotypes that are described really seem to resemble what is going on in, in just simply inflamed tissue. And typically in a lot of the tumor studies or <clears throat> essentially all, almost all tumor studies with the references for the, the immune infiltrate is, is either blood or maybe adjacent healthy tissue. Um, so we just wanted to know, like, well, what if we compare two different cohorts and we compare an inflamed um, tissue environment with a with a inflamed tumor where we, where we have an immune infiltrate. What are some of the shared patterns and what are some of the unique changes? And, and 
obviously we wanted to learn new biology, but we thought, well, if we get really lucky, maybe by having that comparison, we can actually figure out if there is sort of a tumor unique um, immune cell population or a tumor unique process um, that is present in a tumor, but not present in inflamed tissue. And ideally it'd be something that's clinically relevant, right? With the hope that some of the current challenges that we still have, which is targeting something in a tumor specific manner, that would, that would be sort of a step closer to reaching that goal of having uh, sort of tumor specific, more tumor specific um, therapies. <clears throat> so to, to go back to, you know, breaking down a bit how we approach um, sort of our, our science questions and getting back to the clinicians and cohorts. So we worked with, with Doug um, and, and with Doug, we got all mucosal tissue that was inflamed. And that was sort of our inflamed tissue that did be used as a baseline. And then uh, in collaboration with Brittany, uh, we examined head and neck squamous cell carcinomas. And those were mainly oropharyngeal carcinomas. And there's two things I want to point out for these cohorts. So one, for the oral mucosa, the, the part that from a sort of basic immunology perspective is, is really nice is that uh, they're essentially treatment naive tissues, right? People don't take steroids because they have inflamed gingival tissue. So we can actually really study sort of unperturbed uh, inflamed uh, tissue. And then for head and neck squamous cell carcinomas, uh, surgical resection is the first line of treatment. So again, similar to the oral mucosal tissue, we can actually look at the unperturbed and sort of treatment naive um, immune infiltrate in the tumor. So what happens with head and neck squamous cell carcinomas is you have first resection, then depending on, on um, the extent of metastasis that is found in a draining lymph node, the, the further treatment is then decided with radio and, and chemotherapy. So for from a purely immun immunology point of view, sort of having these unperturbed immune environments um, we felt that lent itself really well to try and do that comparison with this approach. <clears throat> and the, um, the people in the lab who the, the two postdocs really initiated that, that um, project and were driving it were uh, Jamie Erickson, who's now at, at Abbey in Chicago and, and Florian Meyer, who's actually now back. He came, he came from as a postdoc from, um, or as a grad student from um, Burkhardt's lab uh, to, to, um, my lab and is actually now back in um, in Zurich again. Uh, and Jamie and, and Florian were uh, they were just an amazing team. And initially, the way this worked out is was that Jamie was mainly focused on the T cell work, and and Florian really focused on sort of the antigen presenting cell aspect. Um, and and both looked at the tumor and um, and the inflamed mucosal tissue. And then as I'll as I'll outline in in sort of the next. Um, few slides is how everything ended coming back together a bit uh, and com being combined a bit. So, so our general strategy was um, to use the, the technologies that I highlighted a little bit um, at the beginning is to essentially use full cytometry, um, so 28 color slash 30 parameter T cell panel that we tried to do with every tissue and then uh, also a, um, a 30 parameter myeloid panel that essentially captured uh, macrophage and dendritic cell subsets. And I'll talk about the analysis part in a little bit. And then what we also um, uh, tried and do is whenever we could is, is if there was enough tissue is to, to save some cells for downstream single cell RNA-seq. And initially our idea was, well, we can use this to just try and dive a bit deeper into um, the phenotype um, of the cells to be fine in the two more make comparisons. And then, Marie joined the lab a bit later and was was really critically important to help us get get everything across the finish line. So, so I'll outline to you a bit how we how we started with that comparison and and the first part of it was just really a very broad comparison where we just asked, well, what is the distribution of the immune cell subsets if you look at um, mucosa and tumor and what you see in blood is actually the two cohorts combined, because we essentially just wanted to make sure that in, in context of their peripheral immunity, that those two cohorts were really um, comparable. And if you look at the, the T cell infiltrate in mucosa is in orange, and then tumor is in red, sort of the frequency of immune um, cells is, is very much, um, uh, of, the, of T cells is very much the same within the immune compartment within the 45 positive cells. Uh, similar for the, the B cells, 
and um, there's not really that many K cells in either the inflamed or um, tumor tissue, at least you know the oral mucosal tissues that we looked at. Um, so as a CD T cell, you know, person that was that was, um, and that's mainly what I'm going to be focusing on today is the, the T cell part. Um, that was, of course, something that I was really interested in as well. Once we start to look a bit more into T cell subsets, are there any differences? So CD69 and CD103 um, are biomarkers that are used to um, indicate um, tissue residence for CD8 T cells. So if you compare the oral mucosa and the tumor, uh, they actually look very similar. Uh, and then if you, if you, uh, this is just an example plot, and then across the, the, uh, the patient tissues that we looked at, there was really no, no difference. Uh, we've, we, of course, looked also at, at PD-1, right? So PD-1 is both an activation marker, but also um, indicates or can indicate um, exhaustion or a dysfunction of T cells. And we actually really didn't see a difference in terms of um, frequency um, or even, even just um, how much PD-1 was expressed on CD T cells between the CD T cells and inflamed tissue and the tumor tissue, which I think highlights one of the challenges that we have with some of the therapies, right? It's not just that dysfunctional um, CD T cells in the tumor or T cells in general in the tumor express PD-1. You actually do see that in inflamed tissues um, as well. So, um, so a lot of congruence is, is sort of the bottom line that we initially saw just looking at, at subsets. The one, the one difference that really stood out to us um, was a difference in the abundance of, of Tregs. So uh, again, orange is the inflamed mucosa and red is the tumor. And as you can see, the frequency of Tregs within the C4 T cell compartment was, was much higher in the, in the tumor and these cells um, were FOXP3 positive and CTLA4 positive. Um, and I should add too that finding that um, increase in T-Rex was, was not really surprising and has been uh, reported before in other tumors and, and also in, in head and neck squamous cell carcinomas. Um, and what I'm showing you here is, um, is a figure from a review that uh, Dari Vinali uh, uh, and uh, his group wrote a, a little while ago. And essentially it just highlights what the, the role of T-Rex is in the in the tumor, uh, which is really suppressing the anti-tumor response, um, and they can do that by by various um, mechanisms, uh, direct and and indirect. So, if you have this expanded Treg population, right, then then presumably that is associated with a lot of suppression in the in the tumor microenvironment. Um, so. With everything that I've told you so far, um, we saw a lot of congruence. We found something that that was not necessarily that novel because people have sort of observed it before, but we have these really high parameter data sets, right? So how do we actually now identify um, biologically meaningful changes? How do, we make, how do we make sure that we put those, those high parameter data sets um, to its best use? Um, and this is when the analysis approach um, comes in and I think is critically important. Um, so this we, we did in collaboration with um, Rafael Cotardo, who I um, mentioned earlier, and, and what Rafael and, and Evan Green and, and Greg Fenech, um developed is, is a machine learning approach that they called FAUST, um, which stands for full annotation using shape constraint trees. And essentially rather than um, sort of manually trying to look for, for differences, right, which once you have a, a decent number of, of samples is with these big, big data sets, it's basically impossible. You use this machine learning approach um, to, to start with um, essentially unsupervised gating trees, and then you just look for differences between two groups. In our case, it was inflamed and, and two more, um, uh, but you can also use it in context of, you know, for example, cancer immunotherapy to look at responders and, and, and non-responders. Um, so, so Faust is what we use to try and find differences in our high parameter data sets. And, and I think one thing to keep in mind here is, is that we felt what we really needed to find is something that was, um, that would lend itself to follow-up questions. So we did see some difference in the antigen presenting um, cell compartment, um, but a lot of the differences that we saw, if you look at the, 
the plot down here, it's it's fairly small immune subsets um, where we felt there wasn't anything that we could realistically do with the tools that are um, available at this point in terms of follow-up experiments or really figuring out what their, um, their role is so to learn more about biology. Um, so that, that we felt was going to be easier with um, the T cell subsets. We saw some changes in the CD T cell um, compartment, uh, but then the one thing that was really consistent was um, in that was enriched in the tumors was this population of what seemed to be um, most likely regulatory, regulatory T cells um, that started to express um, echoes and HLADR that were a lot more abundant in the tumor compared to the mucosal tissue. And I should add the the reason uh, why I'm showing you sort of these these funny looking plots. That's essentially the output of Faust that you get. So that's the population, uh, and it only indicates which which are the markers that are expressed in one subset uh, in one tissue over the other. Um, is is the uh, is using this these very in some in some instances sort of elaborate. Um, um, expression patterns. So nothing you could ever really find by just manual, or I think would be hard to find with manual gating. Um, so we got our data output from Faust, and then we decided to look a bit more into, into these regulatory T cells and essentially just confirm uh, the predict or predicted the um, sort of the differentially expressed phenotype with manual gating. And what do you look, what do you see up here? If you look up here is uh, the Tregs. And in the oral mucosa, this is ICOS on, on Y and HLADR on X. In the oral mucosa, you don't really seem to have these ICOS positive cells that Faust um, identified uh, that also express HLADR, but we do have them in the tumor. Uh, and then below is just showing conventional CD4s. So essentially, the, the population identified by Faust, we could confirm that by manual gating as well. Um, so I'm I'm truly only sort of summarizing the, the big picture takeaway points here. And, and I really emphasized, I think the extensive congruence for the T cell compartment, we actually saw it for the, for the antigen presenting cell compartment um, as well, you know, sort of the M2 type macrophages, we also find in inflamed tissues, the MREC disease, um, but I'm kind of skipping over this today just to make sure um, there's enough, enough time to talk about some of the things that I think are also really important that we usually don't talk about too much in, in these talks. So hopefully you'll you'll find that useful. So initially we felt um, with the um, with our single cell RNA seq data that we could maybe just add um, more depth to our uh, flow cytometry data. Um, but I think in the end we actually got very lucky um, because we had the single cell RNA seq data. We were just getting it. And then the following paper came out. It's it's called NicheNet uh, modeling intracellular communication by linking ligands to target genes, and that was sort of the point where we're talking to you know to Jamie and Florian who who did all this work. We're like, well, we could combine our T cell and APC data, and let's look for for crosstalk using NicheNet between these cells, and maybe this way we get actually a, a better understanding what might be going on in the tumor versus inflamed tissue. Uh, but of course, we weren't quite sure at that point what to expect from from NicheNet, and this was the this was sort of the data set that we used in our um, NicheNet analysis. So <clears throat> we sorted um, T cells out of the tumor, and then the antigen presenting cells. We also included blood again, just to make sure that in the peripheral blood there was pretty good congruence um, across sort of the total of eight donors, so four four for each um, tissue. And then we plugged this um, into NicheNet. And I want to highlight here why I think NicheNet is so such a powerful tool and, and also incredibly clever. So a lot of the communication prediction tools essentially look at ligand and receptor expression. The one thing that really makes NicheNet distinct um, when, it, when it came out is not only did it look at the receptor expression, um, it also looked at sort of the downstream gene targets. So if you got a signal, do you actually pick up on the genes that would be expressed as a result of having a signal. So that makes it very powerful, not only in context of maybe preventing false positives, but um, as probably most of you know, and, and just to emphasize that, right in single cell data, um, you don't always pick up each gene in every single cell. So you might not necessarily see receptor expression in every single cell, but then picking up the downstream signature is still something that, um, um, that you could um, accomplish. 
so we we did this uh, and played around a little bit with you know different cell types sending um, signals and different cell types um, receiving signals. And what I want to focus on here, what I want to show you is what happened when we had the regulatory uh, T cells, so the CD4 T regs as the receivers, <clears throat> and then the antigen presenting cells um, as the senders. Um, and I want to just highlight a couple things here. So one thing that, that came up we were super excited about was ICOS, right? So ICOS we already saw by flow cytometry predicted by Faust that we have more ICOS expressing cells in the tumor. And then this came up by Nishina too. So that was that was great news. And then almost sort of a positive control because we knew that the T-Rex were expanded and activated in the tumor. Um, L2 receptor alpha, beta, and gamma came up as something that um, was, was um, preferentially occurring in, in the tumor over the inflamed tissue. And then two things that stood out a bit to us that were curious, um, one more so maybe um, than the other was the expression uh, and predicted signaling uh, through the IL-1 receptor, so IL-101, as well as the um, um, IL-18 receptor. And it was particularly the IL-1 receptor, IL-101, that was um, curious to us because there's really not a lot out there in, in context of what an IL-1 signal in, would do for, for CD4 Tregs. And the L1 or 2 was expressed too, and that's sort of a, a decoy receptor, so that would prevent signaling. So we just, as a next step, decided to look at a protein expression, right? I mean, all of this is based on sequencing, transcript data. So let's go back to full cytometry and see if we can even find protein expression on our T-Rex from the tumor. Uh, and that's the, the bottom row here, um, the, the dark red. And we did indeed observe L1 or 1 expression actually quite a bit on T-Rex um, in the tumor not really on uh, in blood uh, or a conventional C4 and CD T cells. And we didn't see expression of the uh, sort of the um, receptor that would inhibit um, L1 signaling. So L101 is expressed by a large fraction of T-Rex in the tumor. So there is the possibility of, of signaling just like NicheNet predicted. And now we tried to see if we could use the flu cytometry data that we had, that big data set, and see if it's sort of really fits in together with our single cell RNA-seq data set and see if the data are actually congruent and supportive of each other. So we wanted to know if these L101 Tregs and also the predicted ICOS expression, is that the same Treg subset that we pulled out using Faust from our flow cytometry data? And when we gated on L101 positive Tregs from the tumor, they're essentially uniformly ICOS positive. They also expressed L18 receptor, which was another prediction from NicheNet, and a lot of them um, expressed CXCR6. So we really think because of the uniform expression of L101 T-Rex, that was sort of the first hint that we got um, that we're looking at the same um, at the same T-Rex population. So just as a sort of a overview here, make sure we're still all on, on the same page. <clears throat> so essentially by comparing inflamed non-malignant tissue and, and tumor tissue, by comparing the immune infiltrate, so we did single cell RNA-seq, and then we used NicheNet, and then followed up with experimental validation. And what I showed you was the protein expression of IL-1 or 1, 18 receptor 1, and ICOS on the CD4 Tregs. What I'm, I'm not showing you today, what we also looked at is to see if IL-1 was actually made and is available in the in the tumors. We looked at tumor lysets and you can really find um, um, L1 alpha and, and L1 beta. <clears throat> um, so all the signals that were um, predicted to occur by NicheNet are actually really present in the in the tumor and micro, micro environments. We were very um, excited about that. So so after after that validation, we actually wanted to know if these L101 positive uh, T Rex are actually distinct from IL one and um, a one negative T Rex. Um, so we did some transcriptional analysis and they came up as distinct. And then we also did a um, ex vivo suppression assay. Um, and it took a little bit to um, to get done, mainly because um, would would Florian ended up doing here, um, which I felt was was quite the heroic effort was sorting not just the T-Rex, um, both the IL-101 positive and IL-101 negative T-Rex out of the tumor, but also the, the intratumoral T-cells. Those were the T-cells where um, those responses we were trying to, to suppress. 
Um, so essentially, you would stimulate your T cells, the CD4s and, and CD8s. And I'm just showing the CD8 here, but the CD4s look very similar uh, with anti CD3, CD28 beads. And then you add in your T regs. And as you can see here, the all 101 positive T regs are even more potent than their negative counterparts in suppressing proliferation um, of intratumoral CD8 T cells when they're responding. Um, effector functions are also similarly suppressed if we just look at how much grinds and B or IL-2 or gamma is um, in the supernatant of these, of these cultures. So all of this was really pointing at, um, um, at the IL-101 uh, positive T-regs, at them being uh, more, uh, possibly even more, likely more suppressive than the IL-101 negative T-cells. Um, so we used NicheNet to find these cells, we did some of the validation on the protein level to make sure that the prediction was, was accurate. Um, and at this point, actually, I have to say that basically almost everything that we've looked at so far that was predicted by NicheNet, we could find on the protein level too. I mean, I, I, I've just been really amazed with how, how powerful of a tool NicheNet is. Um, and now we started to try and find some of these differences between the L1 and L101 negative T-regs versus L101 positive T-regs. And, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, uh, we wanted to, to know if the those T-regs are potentially clinically relevant, right? That was one of the things that we thought, well, if we get really lucky, maybe we find something that's tumor enriched or tumor unique that could serve as a, as a therapeutic target. So could those T-regs be a potential therapeutic target well, there are a large fraction of the Treg um, compartment um, are these L101 positive Treg. It's obviously donor dependent, but in some donors, it's up to 80% of the Treg are the L101 positive Treg. Um, and then we did the following thing: essentially, we ask, well, if we get an ICOS positive and L101 positive cells that are that are CD45 positive, so essentially looking at all the immune cells, right, like bone marrow derived, hematopoietically derived cells, if we ask who is double positive, who expresses ICOS in L101, um, and then we did the backgating, essentially it turned out that that was um, almost or basically exclusively um, just T-Rex. So that's when we got really excited. Um, and then of course we still had to ask, well, if we, if we look um, at the frequency of these cells in tumor versus inflamed tissue, is there a difference? And we did indeed uh, observe that it's highly enriched in, uh, in tumor tissue compared to inflamed tissue. So the reason why we got so excited was, well, so the L101 positive T-Rex can be identified with that co-expression of L101 and, and ICOS. And they're also highly enriched. And because we can, <clears throat> we can identify them by the expression of two surface proteins, right? Both L101 and ICOS are expressed on the cell surface. And because it's unique across all immune cell subsets, um, that really suggests that it lends itself well as a, a viable therapeutic target, you know, for example, a bispecific antibody that would only recognize these double positive cells as a potential way to really now manipulate the um, the tumor immune infiltrate in a in a uh, possibly or hopefully like like fairly specific manner, um, there was also a study that came out that we got very excited about um, that it was a small clinical trial and essentially they asked rather than doing the traditional approach of doing resection first and then chemo radiotherapy and then possibly. Uh, you know, giving anti-PD-1 to patients, they wanted to know if you can actually do pre-surgical um, anti-PD-1 treatment, if there was a potential benefit. And they did indeed found that there are responders and non-responders. And the non-responders, one hallmark was that these non-responders had more T-Rex in, um, in the tumor. So potentially, again, suggesting that trying to target the T-Rex in the tumor would then actually allow for uh, better therapeutic responses to other, uh, um, to other uh, therapies or maybe something that could be combined with anti-PD-1. So, so we, were, um, we were sort of, you know, really, I guess, pleasantly surprised. I mean, you, you, you kind of dig and hope for the best, but um, and excited that we, that we found this. Uh, in terms of the, the potential therapeutic value. But then we also wanted to do some more 
biology and essentially ask, well, what actually elicits our one-on-one expression and why has this phenotype not been reported or observed so far with you know all these studies that have focused on the on the T-ray compartment. Um, and I'm just going to summarize this a bit. So we found that T cell receptor signals are actually sufficient to induce L101 expression and congruent with the notion that, that a T cell receptor signal drives the um, expansion of Treg is that we found that the L101 positive Tregs in the tumor actually clonally expanded. We also, uh, and I'm not going to show the, the data here today, we also tried to figure out what the L1 signal actually does to the T-Rex, and it does seem that the L1 signal itself um, potentially just enhances and uh, facilitates cell, um, cell proliferation. Um, but, you know, one thing that was very puzzling to us is why this phenotype hasn't really been reported or observed so far, and I think one um, or two, two sort of explanations for that is that mouse T-Rex do not appear to express L101 after TCR engagement, at least not the T-Rex out of uh, B6 mice. We tried that with Fox P3 GFP mice, and we had a positive staining control right, to make sure that the L101 antibody was working. But if you activate mouse T-Rex um, uh, with anti-CD3, CD28 beats, they just don't have that induced L101 expression the way that human T-Rex do. So I think there is just a, a difference there and maybe you would miss that uh, in the mouse model. Um, I also have to say, we only really found L101 because of NicheNet. If you if we just had looked at a heat map, right, or a volcano plot, uh, or any sort of the, the more typical analysis approaches, L101 would not have been um, necessarily something that we would have picked out. So I think the analysis part for us to find L101 and really dive into it was, was very critical. Um, so with what I've told you so far is that there's a substantial phenotypic congruence between the immune infiltrate and inflamed and tumor tissues. We found this large population of um, L101 positive, ICOS positive T-Rex in tumors. Um, I, I didn't show you this today, but they are transcriptionally distinct and um, based on, on the um, assays that we've done, it does seem that the, they are possibly the most suppressive Treg population um, in the tumor. So I just want to um, highlight again the, the therapeutic potential that I had mentioned with, with the bispecific antibodies. So essentially what that would entail, right, is making an antibody that doesn't have high affinity to just bind to single expressing cells. So cells that would only express ICOS or only IL-101, but essentially only truly binds, and this was, I think, really nicely described in this, um, uh, this commentary, only really binds to cells that express both the IL-101 and, uh, and ICOS. Um, and I already mentioned it a, a couple of times now, but I really want to emphasize this today that the data analysis was uh, so critical and instrumental for us to discover new biology. And I think that at the same time, also very exciting to us because now we really can discover new biology, like working with human tissues. And it's not like this has never been done before, right? The concept of central and effector memory T cell was actually discovered um, studying human T cells by Ansevekian. And so we'll do at this point over, over 20 years ago, right? And T follicular helper cells were first described um, out of human tonsils um, by Bernhard Mosa. Um, so there, there, are these, there are these, you know, previous occurrences where, where discovery really started with human tissues, like for, for immunology. But I think now we just have tools to, to be able to do this, um, I think hopefully more, um, more often. Um, so yeah, Faust was one key tool for us and Nishna the other one, and hopefully those will be useful uh, tools for, for many other labs too and for immunology community. And um, there was um, a really nice, um, editorial in, in Cell about the importance of, of these um, analysis approaches to discover new biology. And I think there's still so much that needs to be done and that has to be done uh, in terms of studying immune responses, particularly in human tissues across a wide range of, of diseases um, that I'm, yeah, it's just, I think a very exciting time to be an immunologist because I think there's a lot that we can learn now. Um, and, I want to highlight one one thing here in just the last the last five minutes or so here <clears throat> is that I think 
it's it's great to have all these 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 sort of high tech and super sophisticated approaches, but it's also very uh, obviously cost intensive. And I think there is still um, a lot of opportunity to discover new biology. What I what I just kind of called here the old fashioned way, which is sort of you know reading papers and digging into PubMed. And um, I just want to give you a quick example here. Um, so this is the same slide that I showed you earlier in my talk about how T-Rex suppress um, um, anti-tumor responses. And you know one of the key um, cytokines, and you, you see this in the literature over, over and over, is TGF-beta. Um, so if you look for TGF-beta and T-cells in PubMed, right, there's over 10,000 papers, TGF-beta in cancer, there's almost 30,000 papers. So it's something that's been, um, that's been published on very extensively. So is there any new biology that really still can be discovered, right? It seems like it's very firmly established that TGF beta just suppresses um, um, T cell effector responses. And, um, but if you, if you dig through all these papers, um, um, a lot of what's been done is essentially asking, well, what happens when naive T cells get activated or effector T cells? Um, and what's the effect of TGF beta then? And a lot of it done with, um, conditional knockout models, which are an incredibly useful and powerful tool. Uh, the question that we ended up asking is, well, what happens when we have memory CD T cells? And we did this in the mouse model system, actually. Um, what happens if you have memory CD T cells and now they get reactivated in either the presence or absence of TGF beta? And then we did some, some full cytometry, just classic ex vivo stem assays, some RNA-seq, some attack-seq, and to try and figure out what are the what are the effects that teach if beta has in reactivation uh, itself because that was something that really had not been addressed in the literature and memory reactivation often we think just in context of of reinfection right of sort of recall responses to a viral infection or bacterial infection but um, even in context of anti-tumor responses the the cells that respond to anti-pd1 treatment are really memory t cells uh, and there were a couple nice studies that that highlighted that so that is why we ask well what happens during memory reactivation and i just want to show you so this is unpublished this is unpublished data i just want to highlight like two two things to you um so we did see so these were ot1 memory t cells um so if we stimulate um with with the antigen with the peptide that to recognize um, what is differentially expressed um, with the stimulated ones in red versus the, the green blue um, here is, is stimulated in presence of TGF beta is you, you add TGF beta, you, you, um, you lose expression of these um, cytotoxic genes, like Gransom A, Gransom B, perforin, and that's expected, right? I mean, people have reported it before. Interestingly, interestingly interferon gamma actually was not affected, neither by transcript, nor actually on the on the protein level. So for reactivation, TGF beta had a very limited impact on that. But what we got really excited about is um, that what TGF beta did in context of reactivation is elicit actually, so not suppressed, but elicit expression of chemokine receptors um, such as CCR8 or CXCR3, uh, and then. We followed up on all of this on the protein level as well. Um, if this is something that you're more interested in, we, we actually put it in bioarchive. And the person who did all the work is um, Alexis Tabram in the lab, who's an incredibly talented um, technician um, and, and was very diligent with the extent of the experiments too, because she looked at it um, across a range of different TGF beta doses as well. Um, so a lot of lot of titrations. Um, and I think she she found a very compelling um, phenotype after that sort of, and I think it sort of revises the way we have to think about TGF beta, uh, for example, as a therapeutic target, because if you target TGF beta, you're not going to just rescue effector function, you're actually also going to alter their chemotactic properties of these memory CD T cells, so it's just something that, that um, has to be kept in mind, and obviously there needs to be follow-up studies also looking at, at human cells. But um, by highlighting what Alexis had accomplished um, uh, and all the work that that she's done, um, I, I do want to take that to to emphasize sort of the the last bit that hopefully has become clear. Anyways, how important it is that the people who who work with us um, are just um, like tremendous colleagues. And um, in that context, I've been not just very fortunate with the the clinical collaborators. Um, that I've had now for a few years, but also the people in the uh, in my labs. I already mentioned Florian and Jamie quite a bit. Um, 
um, Amanda was the, the first postdoc who really started uh, the collaboration with the gingival tissue where we compared healthy and inflamed. Um, Ava is uh, as opposed to currently in a lab was continuing um, all that work on, on uh, the immune responses in, in the tumor and as well as, as the tumor draining uh, lymph nodes and then F, some people in the lab, so Caitlin and uh, Vani and, and Andrew is doing some of that as well, who actually look at immune responses in the maternal fetal interface. Um, there's actually interestingly a lot of interesting parallels between immune responses in a tumor and a placenta, but that's sort of a, a whole different long story for um, for another day. Uh, and then um, Steve, who is uh, uh, now has his own lab, uh, which UAN fellow who, who really uh, helped us initiate the placenta project, uh, and as well as um, Matt, who's a staff scientist, and Elizabeth, who keeps our lab um, running. So with that, I want to do one. Oh, uh, yeah, a couple more acknowledgments. Uh, the collaborators that I've had at the Fred Hodge, so Rafael Gotardo and his group, um, um, Evan, Evan Newell, Florent Haldick, Jenny Lund, and Phil Bradley, all the, the funders, and particularly NIDCR has been um, incredibly supportive. Um, um, collaborators at, at UW, so I already mentioned Doug a few times, who's now at Tennessee, and, and Brittany, uh, and James and Dietmar, uh, who's a longstanding collaborator of mine, and, and Aaron as well. And here's the last plug that I wanted to show you. Um, so Florian um, wrote a, uh, at this point, I guess two years ago, um, sort of a guide for how to deal with full cytometry data with these high dimensional full cytometry data sets. So if this is something that you're interested in, um, I would I would highly recommend um, reading this because I think data that are free of technical flaws are incredibly important to make sure what we discover is sort of truly new biology, right? And, and not sort of a artifact of a, a technical issue. And it's a bit of a follow-up um, on, on this key uh, guide that the Herzenbergs wrote um, I think around 2006. Um, and um, yeah, um, I think hopefully this is gonna be a really great resource for the community. And with that, um, that's the end of my talk. And I just wanna thank the organizers again for having me. And if, yeah, anyone has questions, you know how to reach out. And I hope sort of this bit of a different take on not just going through data plots, but sort of describing a bit of the consideration that went into it and how we pieced everything together. Hopefully that was um, that was helpful. It was indeed, Marty. It was a, a wonderful uh, seminar. It was super exciting. And uh, I, I think it's it's very important. Some of the aspects that you that you mentioned there to discover biology by looking at PubMed, et cetera. It's, it's, it's just really, really cool the way you, you put this together. Um, I have a ton of questions for you. I am sure the people who have been listening to you now or who will be listening to your seminar on uh, in the YouTube video that we're going to publish um, have a ton of questions for you. But what we do at Global Immunotalk, just as a reminder, and you see it here on the slides, you're all welcome to pester Martin with millions of talks. And the way to do it is to go through um, X, formerly known as Twitter, and ask your questions there. So um, this is a rather unceremonial ending, but basically that's what I uh, want to thank you one more time for this wonderful seminar and everybody else for uh, their attention and interest in Global Immunotalks. And we'll be seeing you next week with a lecture by Chiara uh, Romagnani, um, who will be speaking next uh, Wednesday. So without further ado, thank you very much for listening to us.